As we begin this morning, I'm going to ask a question, what are you going to do? And the question uh, will be asked again at the end of the lesson. What are you going to do? In a world in which some people, many people, doubt the existence of God and even uh, wonder if there's a standard of right and wrong, I suggest to you that God is real and that there is a standard, His Word of, the Word of God, the Bible. And I would like to uh, go over some things with you, but I have a, a question at the end of this, which is this question, what are you going to do? So, in the interest of time, we'll get right to it. First of all, I believe that there is evidence that God exists. And there's a lot of things I'd like to say about that, but I think if we just go to Romans chapter 1 and consider verses 18 through 25 together, <coughs> excuse me, Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are <coughs> excuse me, clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let <clears throat> me just a second. I mowed yesterday for two and a half hours and my asthma is really getting to me now, so I'm paying the price. Good old Luke with these back brace on can't mow for me, so. Because all they, they knew God, verse 21, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. This is an important passage of Scripture, I believe, because it says something about God. It says something, it makes a claim about God. And the first thing I want you to notice is that what, be, what may be made known of God, God has shown it to His creation. In other words, uh, we don't just believe in something that we don't see just kind of blind faith. We believe in something that we do see. I can't see God personally, but I can see the evidence of God everywhere. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood <coughs> by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So basically what that means is that you can't, uh, when you look around you and you see the created world, you realize that everything was made, that somebody made all of this, and there's no one who can say on the last day, in the day of judgment, I'm sorry, I didn't know you existed, because the evidence of him is everywhere. It has been clearly shown, clearly revealed. There's evidence that God exists, but what is a standard of right and wrong? Is there a standard of right and wrong? I suggest to you that there is. Just as surely as God exists, and there's evidence of that, there's also evidence that his, his word is, is real. <clears throat> I'm have a hard time getting through this morning. There's inspiration in, of the Bible. The Bible, as we call it, a collection of 66 books, is a collection of writings that were put together by roughly 40 men or so over a span of about 1,500 years, and many of these people never even met. The Bible is an intricately woven fabric without spot or blemish or tear. And you have a lot of harmony in Scripture that we don't have time to get into this morning, but the evidence is all there. And so just in the interest of time, I want to share a couple passages with you because the Bible says it's the Word of God. I believe it's the Word of God, first of all, because the Bible makes the claim of inspiration, but also that claim can be amply documented by the evidence to be absolutely true. And uh, there's a couple passages I want you to consider. One is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, if you'd please turn in your Bibles to that passage. <clears throat> you know, like a year ago, if I cough, nobody worried about it. You cough now, it's like, COVID-19, you know. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 
Paul says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be uh, complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I want you to notice that in this passage that Paul says all Scripture, everything that's pinned down, everything that you have in the collected Bible is considered all Scripture. Paul says that it is all inspired of God. And that's an interesting expression in English. In Greek, it actually comes from the word theonoustos, theos meaning God and noustos meaning breathe. So Paul is saying that all Scripture, the Bible, is God breathed. He breathed this. He, this came from the mind and the mouth of God. Another passage of Scripture to consider is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Actually, 19 through 21. Peter says, We also have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in the darkness. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing that this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. <clears throat> a prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Similarly, as we saw in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, there is some expression in English that has some really interesting meaning in the original Greek language. To be moved by the Holy Spirit literally means to be borne along by, as if carried by God's Spirit, uh, to say or write down what has been spoken or written. And so this is what the Bible claims of itself, and that if we see that there is true evidence of God that exists, somebody created all of this, somebody made all of this, and then there's a, a, a Bible that suggests that this came from that God. If this is true, then we really need to take heed of this because of the things that are mentioned this is something that came from God. It didn't come from man. Nobody wrote it down like a novel. It's not something that, that came from the heart or mind of man. That's what Peter just said. It came from the Spirit, Spirit of God. If you were to take a survey of the Bible and you were to look at uh, uh, various passages of Scripture, I don't have all of them I could have put up here. This is just kind of a smattering of them. But look at the claims that the Bible, the Bible writers made. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven, the psalmist says. In Exodus 20 and verse 1, an entirely different guy. This would be Moses. And God spoke all these words. Exodus 24 and verse 7. All that the Lord has said we will do. Deuteronomy 5 verse 22. These words the Lord spoke. Matthew 22 verse 31. Have you not read what was spoken to you by God? There's a lot of claims in Scripture that the Scriptures themselves came from God, and it is something that, that man is supposed to take to heart. Understand that this came from a divine creator and that it was given to his people. There's a reason for that. The Bible, if you look at it just kind of superficially at a quick glance, is made up of, of basically two things. One, known facts, which is history and revelation. Revelation basically meaning... God making known to man that which man would otherwise have no way of knowing. It's something that God revealed. It's unveiled. It was previously hidden or maybe a mystery for us. Revelation comes in two parts. We just mentioned it in, in uh, Romans chapter 1 and verses 18 through 21. Natural revelation. General revelation. Somebody built the pews you're sitting in. Somebody made the carpet that we walk on, that your feet are resting on right now. Somebody has even laid this carpet. Somebody else. I, I doubt the same guy that made it laid it down. Somebody made this little clicker here. Gary, where'd you buy it from? Best Buy. Best buy. They didn't make it. But even they would tell you, somebody made it. They could tell us who it was. Maybe it says on here something. Made in China. Well, I guess we start there. There's evidence of everything. Anything you see in the tangible world, somebody made it. Now, someone made this. Someone made that table. Someone made the car. Even if it's automated uh, you know, with, with the machinery, it's still uh, run by man. But no man can build a tree. No man can build grass in, 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 the, in the rocks and, and, and the outer space, the sun and the moon and the stars. Someone of a greater being, someone of a divine nature has made these things. These things didn't just exist, they were made. Life itself teaches us very simply 
that there is a God just by the things we observe. Now, you can know that there is a God just by the things you can observe in nature because somebody made all this stuff. But what you cannot know is the mind of God. You cannot know the will of God for you. And that's why God gave us something else, special revelation. And that is the word of God. It is through the word of God, through special revelation, that we have the ability to know who God is specifically, who we are in relation to that God, and exactly who, how God sees us in sin and what we need to do about that and God's remedy for that. And there's a lot of things that the Word of God actually portrays and, and actually uh, proclaims and expresses that we couldn't know unless God had it written down for us. That's how revelation works. Now, the single greatest internal evidence or proof of the Bible's inspiration is prophecy. And the idea of prophecy is real simple. It is always minutely foretold and completely in detail fulfilled. It was not some kind of rough guess at something. I could do that. In 100 years, if there still stands, there'll probably be some more someplace. Is that profound? Is there not war almost every in every year of life? It, I mean, it's a safe guess there's going to be some kind of battle, some kind of struggle. If the earth stands 100 years from now, there's still human beings, and, and the earth still stands, there's probably going to be some kind of struggle. That's not much of a prophecy, is it? That's just a, that's a prediction based on, on, on basically the track record of human history. Now, if I were to tell you something very detailed, maybe even a person's name, and exactly maybe who they were or what, they, what kingdom they were associated with or, or, or perhaps something that would, would happen very specifically to a time and place. And that were to come true, well, I must know the future then. See, Bible prophecy was always 100%. It wasn't like best two out of four guesses or best eight out of 16 guesses or anything like that. Whenever Bible prophecy was extended, it would come true completely and in detail. And that was the evidence that uh, whoever spoke that all those years earlier, all that time before, was God. That came from God. It might, it might have been a man that uttered it, but God's the one that told him to say it or write it down. There are very short prophecies. There's a seven-day prophecy. When, uh, when David lost his child in 2 Samuel, God said he was going to take the child. Seven days later, the child dies. That's a seven, that's a week-long prophecy. But there's a lot of prophecies that are much, much longer than that. There are numerous prophecies in Scripture. I'm only going to give you a few. When Moses spoke of Christ in Deuteronomy chapter 18 and said, from, a, from among yourselves, one, a prophet will rise up like me, him you shall hear. He was talking about the Messiah, the Christ. He said that roughly 1,500 years, 1,500 years on a, on a, on a rough, rough curve before Jesus even was born. In Isaiah Chapter 53, Isaiah wrote of the suffering of Christ. He pointed right to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ about 740 years before it happened. And it came true completely and in detail. David spoke of Christ often. In Psalm 16 is one such of many in which he spoke of the coming Messiah. And that was roughly a thousand years prior to to the coming of the Messiah. Joel spoke of the church. He prophesied about the church in Joel chapter 2. That happened about 835 years after he wrote it down. In Acts chapter 2, it was fulfilled in the first century. There are many, many, many Bible prophecies. And all of them that do not pertain to the end of time, because obviously that hasn't happened yet, all of them have come true. All of them have come to fruition. They have been fulfilled exactly as it was spoken of them. That's important to know because as, as surely as we can know that there is a God by the created world and we see that there is something that this God says that we're supposed to believe, we're supposed to read it, we're supposed to embrace it, we're supposed to apply it, we're supposed to live by it. How do we know that we can trust it? If the Bible says anything, even one thing, that doesn't come true, then it's a lie. That's why this is powerful evidence. I wish we had more time to spend on it. Because prophecy, prophecy 
that has been something foretold and would be fulfilled in great detail is exhibit A in the evidence that there is a God and this is actually his word. And if that's true, we need to heed it. But that's not all. The single greatest external evidence or proof of the Bible's inspiration is scientific foreknowledge. Now, uh, obviously, some of you here who have been here for some years have seen this material before this to this point. But uh, just as surely as you like to maybe watch a movie again or listen to the same music over and over again, I doubt you're going to be bothered too much that we cover some of this material again. Doesn't hurt. And there's a lot of people that have not actually seen or heard the material. And I'm building the case because the question that's going to be asked at the end of this is what shall you do or what are you going to do? Because there's a lot of things. And again, I'd love to spend more time. I've got like about 12 examples that I could give you. I'm only going to give you three. In Job chapter 38 and verse 16. In fact, just turn there, if you will. Job chapter 38 and verse 16. God asked Job a question, a couple questions, actually about 77 of them in this chapter. But in verse 16, he asked him too. He says, have you entered the springs of the sea or have you walked in search of the depths? He asked him about the springs of the sea. Have you, have you, have you searched that? Have you, do you know about those? In Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 28, it talks about the great fountains of the deep. Did you know that when... When the global flood of Noah's day, you saw where he was to build the ark in Genesis chapter 6. And then in Genesis chapter 7, you see that the global flood hit the earth. And everything in whose nostrils was the breath of life, man and beast, perished in the water. The only ones saved were the ones in the boat. Right? Growing up, how many of you, in understanding from, from Bible school or Bible class, that you thought that the earth was only flooded by the rain that came down. It rained. The water that came down. It rained, right? The rain came down and the floods came up, right? Well, if, you, if it rains enough, the floods will come up. But did you know, it even mentions in the, in the Genesis account, that not only did the rain fall from the sky, it says, in great wells of the deep were broken up. Water was coming up from beneath the surface of the earth and water was coming down. The people on earth were completely smashed in that water. They were, it was a literal purging. It was a water baptism of the whole globe. To the degree that Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20 that Noah and his family, eight souls were saved through water and says there's also another, an antitype or a like figure that saves us now. Baptism, he says. So he calls that a baptism. They, 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 the water didn't just come down, it came up. They were sandwiched in this water. Job is estimated to be the first book ever written. Genesis says the beginning account. Job, the Bible's put together by subject matter. And that's why you have Moses' first five books first, the beginning, the creation account. But it's estimated in terms of when a book was written that Job is probably the oldest book written. So I have a question then, is that how would Job know anything about the great wells of the deep? How would he know anything about, was that a lucky guess? He just kind of, figured, you know, I'm just going to write this down. It turns out to be true. Is that how it works? Did you know that even to this day, and I didn't know this till a number of years ago. This blew my mind. The oceans are, are compo they're composed of what? What kind of water? Fresh water or salt? Salt water. Some of you have been to the beach recently. Did you get some of that in your mouth? <sighs> get it in your eye? But did you know that in the middle of salt water around Cuba, Australia, and New Zealand, that there are fresh water springs bubbling up with such force? That any naval vessel, the U.S. Navy has done this for years, going to different locations. You want fresh water out in the middle of salt water, you pull up this location, you can heap up, heap up uh, fresh water, but a bucket's full. That blows my mind. Who knew this? Well, the Bible already talked about it. This is scientific foreknowledge. The Bible already spoke of something that man would not discover on his own for many generations later. Thousands of years later, to be exact. Speaking of Noah, remember the ark? God gave specific dimensions, some specific instructions about the ark. He says to make it 300 cubits long, which equates to 450 linear feet, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits tall. 
If you break that down, that's a 30 to 5 to 3 ratio. Ask anybody in the shipbuilding business, particularly for, that could be the U.S. Navy, could be anybody's Navy, what you'll find out is that this is the perfect ratio for seaworthiness. The ark wasn't built for speed. It was basically a barge, and it never sank. Now, how would Noah know that? Moses evidently wrote it down. How did he know that? By the time Noah built the ark, it is estimated, very possibly, that there would have not been a lot of experience in shipbuilding at all in the early going of man. But at any way you look at it, it's the biggest boat built at the time. How would these people even know that that would be true? Today you ask somebody, and if they didn't even know the biblical account, they would be able to say a shipbuilder could say, oh, yes, perfect ratio for seaworthiness. How did the ancient ones know that? Well, blood clotting. Blood clotting is dependent upon three things, vitamin K, prothrombin, and platelets in the blood. And so basically, uh, if you have uh, issues with your blood sometimes in which it will not clot, you're deficient on, on something. And a lot of people have that. There's even a, a disease, or if you will, a blood disease that uh, contributes to that. Now, vitamin K works with the prothrombin. It actually synthesizes it. A, a, a male child born, like say today, they can be circumcised almost immediately after birth, but that's because the doctor or the nurse gives them a shot of artificial, if you were synthetic, vitamin K. So that it immediately uh, works with the prothrombin in their body and begins to clot so they can actually perform surgery. But if you were to do this in a natural way and you didn't re re rely on the shot from the doctor or the surgeon or, or, or the nurse or whoever, you would have to wait a while because evidently, the blood doesn't have the ability to clot very well at all in the early days of the child's life. But on day eight, almost as if magically, it spikes up well above 100% of normal on day eight. If you want to perform a, a surgery, some kind of surgical procedure on a little child, that would be the, the, the first day on your calendar. That would be the day to do that because that's when the blood's going to clot. The question is, as we... Consider that God had given the command of circumcision in Genesis 17 and verse 12, and he says, circumcise them on the eighth day. Why is that day so significant? Why did God not say day one or through seven? Why not, why, why not the earlier days? What was it, what was it that, that Moses, as he writes this down, how would he even know that? These are things that were not known until more modern to our time. Scientific foreknowledge. You have evidence that God exists. You have evidence that the word of God is real. Between internal prophecy, the, the greatest internal evidence that, that this came from a divine being. You have scientific foreknowledge that no one was able to, to predict these things to be true. And in some cases, 4,000, 5,000 years beforehand. So you can believe in God. You can believe that the Bible is the word of God. And with that knowledge in mind, the inspired word of God reveals some real important things for you to know. In bullet point fashion, I want to reveal them to you. The Bible reveals that God created us. Where, have, where did we come from? How did we get here? We didn't just happen. Mankind was created by God. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And uh, then in, skipping to verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The Bible makes that claim. But I can believe the Bible because the Bible has been proven true by a God who exists. Not only did God create us, he created us good. And there is this idea in the religious circles of our world in which we're, they say we're born in sin. But the Bible doesn't actually say that. Time would fail me to go into the great detail of Scripture that proves otherwise, but I'll give you one. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29, Truly, this only I have found, Solomon says, that God made man upright, but they have each turned to follow their own downward path. God made man good. They chose to sin. They chose to do evil. And so the Bible, the trustworthy set of documents that clearly came from a divine creator, proven to be so by a God that's proven to exist, has let us know through his holy script that sin is what separates us from God. 
He made us, He made us good, but we've chosen to sin and we have caused a breach between us. We have burned a bridge between us and God. Isaiah 59 and verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor His ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. That's how it happens. How are you separated from God? How is it that you are now in darkness and you're no longer associated with light, which is where God is? It is because of your sins. It's your transgressions that has caused this. The inspired Word of God also reveals because of that that we need a Savior. I know there's a God by the natural world or the realm around me, but I don't know much else except that God revealed it to me. And God has revealed that because I have sinned, I'm separated from God, I need a Savior. And this is exactly the point and purpose for which Jesus came, the Son of God. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. This was the remedy for sin. Let me be clear. Man, you, on your own, can separate yourself from God. But you, on your own, cannot save yourself. You can do all the damage you want to do, but you can't do anything to salvage anything. It requires, it requires a mediation. It requires some kind of reconciliation. It requires God intervening and providing a way by which we can be saved from the, from the sin and death that we have found ourselves in, have created for ourselves. Matthew 1 and verse 21. Before Jesus would even be born into this world, He's, he's already miraculously conceived according to the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah said as when the Messiah would come, that He would be born of a virgin. Guess what? That happened. Yet another prophecy that was fulfilled in detail. Mary is her name. She had never been with a man. She was a virgin. And yet she's pregnant. Because the Holy Spirit came upon her. Miraculously she conceived. And the person that came from her womb is the Savior of the world. Jesus the Christ. God came down here and became man. He came down here on our level. He came down here to collect us up, basically. He came down here at our level to lead us out of our problems. He came down here to be like us, that He may be able to save us. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. That's what's, that was His point and purpose in life, in His physical life. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Jesus at this point had already died, been buried, and raised from the dead, never to die again. Had already ascended back to His Father in heaven. And the apostles went forth in His name proclaiming the same gospel that Jesus had, had proclaimed when He started His earthly ministry. And Peter says to the crowd on the day of Pentecost, that day that the prophecy of Joel came true. Completely and in detail. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what the inspired Word of God reveals. The inspired Word of God also reveals that there will be a judgment day. Now, if there is a God, and there is, and if His Word be true, and it is, and all of these other points are factually true, and they are, there is surely also going to be this truth, and that is that there will be a judgment day. There will be a final day. In Matthew chapter 25, in verses 31, let's say 31 through 33, the first paragraph of that, that parable there. Mind you again, numerous passages of Scripture talk about the judgment day, but in the interest of time, I give you this one. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another. And he will divide the, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats and he will set the sheep on the right, on his right hand, but the goats will be on the left. In that same storyline, a few verses later, well, we'll come back to that. We're going to come back to that idea. Jesus talks about the separation of, of two. There's going to be a judgment day in which there's going to be a separation. John chapter 5, verses 28, 29. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now that is just as true as any other thing we read in the Holy Script. That is just as true as anything else we read by inspiration 
of God. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in a body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, good or evil. No one will be exempt in the judgment, that, that final day. Nobody can hide. There's not some place you can kind of hang out and maybe he'll leave town. Everyone is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone. You, everyone who's lived since the time of Adam, whenever the end of time shall be, anyone who lives after us, all of us shall be standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Time will not even be a factor anymore. As time comes to an end. There is no one who is exempt from judgment. Now we might be dead before the Lord comes or we might be alive when he returns. As has appointed all men that they must die. And after that comes the judgment. Hebrews 9 verse 27. I don't know if I'll be dead or if I'll be alive. But one thing I do know is I will stand before this judgment seat. As will you. The inspired word of God reveals that. The inspired word of God reveals that there is in fact a heaven and there is in fact a hell. There's a place of reward for the faithful and there's a place of eternal punishment for those who are not. That is very true. Matthew chapter 25 verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That was the sheep that he sat at his right hand by metaphor. The goats represent in that little statement those who are lost, in which he says in verse 41, then he will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you curse it into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The very last verse of that, that reading says, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but they're righteous into eternal life. It is very clear that God is real. It is very clear that the word of God is true. And if that be the case, then we need to take heed to what he says. Because that determines whether we live or whether we die. It determines whether we will be reap the reward of heaven or if we're going to reap the reward of eternal condemnation. And so, these are the facts. Those aren't the myths. Those aren't the suppositions. Those aren't the think so's. These are the facts. The question I started with, I end with, what are you going to do? I hope that this lesson has been beneficial to everyone here. And if there's anyone who realizes that they need to respond to the gospel and, and come to the Lord, perhaps a child of God who needs to repent and come home, or one who needs to obey the gospel at the very beginning, we want to help you with that. A little bit awkward in our day now as we're practicing social distancing, but one thing I would like to encourage you to do if you have any mind at all to obey the gospel. If you want to know more about God and more about His Word and more about His will for you, then I would beg you to seek me after services. And I want to talk with you. I'd love to study with you. And if there's anything I can do to help you to take the right step toward heaven and to help you in your journey home, that's what I desire to do. And if there's anyone here who'd like to be baptized, the water's partially warm. Probably warm enough. Forgot to turn it on until this morning. But uh, we have garments, and if you would like to be baptized into Christ, repenting of your sins, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, yes, I realize it's a physical act, but Jesus commanded it. Salvation is by God. He's the one that dictates how that will work. And it is a, not a physical cleansing, it is a spiritual cleansing. And the very act of doing that is basically the proof of your faith. We cannot be saved unless we have faith. Believing faith is an obedient faith. It's not enough just to know He exists. It's not enough to know that His Word is true. If we uh, will not obey what it says, if our faith doesn't prompt us to act, it, it, it begs for a response. And if we're not willing to respond, we will be lost. And so if there's anything that I can do or we can do to encourage you, we'd like you to think about that. And after services, then uh, perhaps we can talk. I'm not hard to find. Just look for a short guy with really silver hair that looks like a big zero, you know. So gray shirt. All right. But right now we're going to sing this song. We're going to call it the invitation song. Luke's going to lead us. And uh, if you have a, any thought in mind to respond to the gospel call, please uh, let us know after services, but let us go ahead and sing this song now to prepare our minds for that. Go ahead, Luke. <laughs>